Uh, we will now hear from Dan Kaplan. much for having me tonight. Um, I, you know, it's an honor to be here at the College of Complexes. It's something that um, has like such a, a legacy, meaning every week since 1951 that is quite an institution. So thank you uh, for having me. Um, so this talk was advertised on the website as um, being a divestment campaign that targets a retirement fund. So I imagine that many of you might be surprised to see me at the front. Um, since I am not of retirement age, you might have expected someone to be a little bit more seasoned in years um, here at the podium tonight, but you have me. Um, and it speaks to the diversity of the campaign that this isn't specifically about retirement. This is about um, using economic leverage to attain human rights in Israel-Palestine. Um, and that is that our campaign actually has a great degree of, of diversity in age and um, background of all sorts. Um, so I find that when I'm talking about what I do and the campaign butter. that I lead, that it can be a little convoluted um, at the start. Um, especially if you don't have a retirement fund, it's well, why, why, why a retirement fund, or why TI Craft, uh, what is divestment, um, why, why Palestine, why Israel. Um, so I want to take a step back before we talk about Chicago Divest um, and talk about a, another divestment campaign that people are much more familiar with which is the divestment campaign from apartheid South Africa um, that occurred 30, 40 years ago. Um, the campaign that I'm a part of is very much modeled off of that predecessor. And so I think it's important to talk a little bit about what that was and why it worked. Um, so as I'm sure many of us know, um, South Africa previously had an apartheid government that was racially supremacist um, towards whites and discriminated in law and in society against blacks um, and colored. Um, and the, the response globally was to create a boycott campaign and a divestment campaign that targeted South Africa until it dismantled apartheid. Um, the divestment campaign targeted a wide array, array of corporations, um, some of which were South African, but many of which were transnational and profited from the apartheid system. An example would be Polaroid, um, which had this socially responsible reputation in the United States, but um, was contracted by South Africa to provide pictures for um, the passbooks, which were used to help track um, people who were African or people who were otherwise not white um, in terms of their movement, where they could go, where they could not go, and help to reinforce that system. Um, because of a cam vigorous campaign that was targeted against Polaroid, they eventually withdrew from South Africa, as did several other businesses, um, including uh, Barclays Bank, including Coca-Cola, including Shell, um, and one by one, as the businesses started to accumulate, there started to be increasingly more pressure on South Africa, and people also started to see South Africa differently. Um, started to get that, like that there's an apartheid system. It wasn't I, I wasn't alive during that time, uh, but like I understand that like South Africa was not generally viewed as like a a pariah state or something or a place. Um, that had a deeply problematic like system of, of governance. So, fast forward. Um, the campaign that we're doing is very much modeled in in that in that system. Um, 
we are using divestment as a tool to change the way that Palestinians um, are afforded rights um, in Israel and in occupied Palestinian territories. Um, since 1967, um, Israel has occupied um, the Palestinian West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, um, and has enforced a military occupation regime over those um, regions. Um, that regime, which has been going on since 1967, for more than 40 years, um, involves a slew of human rights atrocities, including um, racially segregated roads, um, including checkpoints which disable Palestinians from being able to move within more than five miles, um, which greatly affects people's access to work, education, and hospitals, um, militarized violence. Um, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the attacks on Gaza that happened in 2008 and also this past November. Um, the, there's also, with inside of Israel, um, a series of laws and regulations that um, privilege um, Jewish residents over Palestinian residents. Um, Israel is, um, has a democratic model of government, but that doesn't mean that everybody has equal rights. And in many ways, Palestinian citizens of Israel are not afforded the same ability to own property, um, to marry, to travel, um, and in a lot of informal ways are, discrimi are discriminated against through society, by police, um, in terms of employment. So in 2005, um, Palestinian civil society organizations uh, got together and they issued a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel and against corporations and other cultural and governmental institutions that help to enforce these systems of oppression. Um, this call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions um, is very similar to the South African call. It calls for boycotts of certain corporations. Um, it calls for divestment from certain corporations. And it also has a cultural and academic component as well. Um, and of course, there's also sanctions um, against the state of Israel. Um, we are going to focus tonight on divestment, which is what I am doing. Um, so, our divestment campaign um, focuses on corporations that profit from the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Um, so, we're talking about that 1967 military occupation um, specifically. Um, the corporations that we are targeting, like the boycott of South Africa, some of them are Israeli, the overwhelming majority aren't. And I want to, you know, make, make that distinction, um, not to, because it's important to recognize that we're, the reason that we have these targets is because they are, they are in violation of basic human rights that we are all entitled to. And it's not um, often when um, this campaign or the BDS call is, is um, called out or is, it's, it's a controversial call. And one of the reasons it's controversial is because it's often mistaken for being associated with being anti-Semitic, or it's called, this campaign is called being anti-Semitic, called being anti-Israel. Um, I want to dispel that outright. Um, the call is not targeting certain corporations because they are um, Israeli or because they are run by certain people. It's because what these corporations do, not who they are or who they are owned by or where they reside, but what they do. Um, it's nothing to do, the, the impetus for this call is not because um, of, of where these corporations are based in of themselves, but because of they, they are involved in these transgressions. Um, 
It's also worth noting that this campaign was spearheaded by a Jewish organization called Jewish Voice for Peace, um, which, um, which advocates for a just peace in Israel and Palestine that includes equal rights for all peoples. This campaign, though, is a coalitional framework and also um, is is ran is um it's a membership campaign and there are several groups, not just Jewish Voice for Peace, that belong to it, um, including the American Friends Service Committee, including the U.S. Campaign and the Occupation. Um, so that is sort of the the setup, the premise for um, I guess what Chicago Divest is about. It's a local contingent of this national redivest campaign that is targeting certain corporations for divestments. Um, how are we doing so far? Cool. Um, there, so, see. we're listening, so keep going. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> so, why are we targeting? TIA craft in particular. So I just explained what is BDS. I kind of set the scenario for why divestment. So why TIA craft? Why why retirement fund? Um, is TIA craft directly involved in the occupation? Uh, it's not directly involved, but TIA craft invests in several corporations that are. So um, just a I'm curious. Um, how many is anyone here um, have a TIA craft retirement plan? So um, I'm wondering, for those of you who raised your hands, if you could just um, maybe shout out really quickly um, where you work. Okay. Where did you previously work? I got it through my wife. Okay. Where did she work? Northwestern. Northwestern. So academia. Um, I saw a hand over there. Uh, I had. Mine is through nonprofit work, my and, and an ex-wife who worked at Case Western Reserve, but I still put money into it because I'm still employed by a local nonprofit. It's not an educational institution, but it's a, it's a 501c3. Got it. So, nonprofit. And then, you as well? I work at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Great. All right. UWM. Very cool. Um, so if you couldn't hear, um, the people that just raised their hands um, all work in nonprofits or academia, and it kind of fits TI Craft to a T. TI Craft is one of the biggest retirement corporations in America. They have half a trillion dollars in assets. Um, they are primarily focused in academia, in nonprofits, in the medical field. Essentially, um, job sectors where there is um, an expressed concern for, for humanity and human beings. Um, and the reason for that is because TIA Craft um, has an expressed commitment to socially responsible investments and investing in um, catering investment plans that um, are ethical in nature. Um, TI Craft has been very successful in these fields. In fact, every single college and university in the Chicago area, with, with a couple of exceptions, have TI Craft plans. Um, in part because there's this appeal that if you work in these sectors where you're you're dedicated to advancing, you know, the state of affairs of human beings, you, you generally want to be invested in in a plan that tends to have an ethical component to it. So TIA Craft, their slogan is financial services for the greater good. And they, to their credit, have done a lot to earn that reputation. They were one of the first uh, financial firms of their kind to have a social choice account to be able to retire in a plan that screens out corporations that um, invest in nuclear power, that invest in, that, um, that um, you know, um, are like weapons developers, that uh, manufacture tobacco, that generally have a bad rap sheet for human rights or environmental violations or corporate corruption. Um, additionally, TI Craft 
did, it does have um, a history for divestment. In 2009, they were the first financial institution to divest from Sudan um, because of the Darfur genocide and um, the civil war with the South. So TI Craft, to its credit, has done a lot, but they have a glaring omission, unfortunately, in their socially responsible plan. Um, they invest more than $2 billion in corporations that profit from the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Um, so, in particular, there are, are nine corporations that they um, have significant investments in um, that are committing irrefutable and egregious human rights violations through the occupation. So, um, if you manage to get a brochure, you can open it up and you can see a brief description of some of these corporations. So, I'm not going to name all of them, but to name a couple, um, one of them is Caterpillar, which TI Craft has roughly a $900 million invested in. Um, Caterpillar, which many of you know, construction corporation, um, they're contracted by the Israeli military to provide um, military grade bulldozers which can be armorized and weaponized and are essentially tanks with a shovel at the front. Um, these bulldozers are used by the Israeli military to systematically demolish Palestinian homes and communities um, inside of Gaza, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and also inside of Israel. Um, the reason for these demolitions um, is often given because homes um, do not meet certain building codes. However, so, so the justification is these homes are built illegally and therefore they are demolished. Um, however, if you are Palestinian, it is virtually impossible to build your home legally. There are a variety of building co codes and sectioning and zoning um, that in military areas make it impossible. In less military areas, um, the, the sectioning is, is basically divided so that way it's very difficult to build in Palestinian areas, whereas in Jewish Israeli areas, it's not as difficult. Um, so, in addition to Caterpillar, um, there's Veolia. You may recognize Veolia if you live in the suburbs. They um, are contracted to do trash collection. Um, they also do transportation services and water services in other parts of the world. Um, they are contracted um, by Israeli settlements um, to provide segregated transportation um, inside of the occupied West Bank. So, if you're familiar with the map um, of, of the area of Israel and Palestine, I wish I had a PowerPoint, um, but I don't. But it kind of looks like this, um, or this. And so there's the map, and then there's the West Bank inside, and also Gaza. Um, and perhaps maybe you see this map, and you see this, this splotch that's the West Bank, and you think, well, this, this is a Palestinian area. Um, in reality, the map has lots of little holes cut into it because um, Jewish Israeli communities have been built inside this area is under Israeli military occupation, and there are communities that are, have been built that are exclusively for Israeli Jews um, that are built on stolen Palestinian land. Um, that aren't built without sale to Palestinians for, for compensation of their land, um, that are illegal under international law, and that in terms of a peace process, um, destroy a chance for peace because they prevent um, Palestinians from having a, a continuous territory. Um, so they're incredibly problematic. Um, officially, United States policy is against uh, settlements. The official policy globally for almost every single country in the world is against settlements. Um, because they're bad for the peace process, but also because they're incredibly immoral. Um, so Veolia provides segregated transportation um, on roads that are for Jewish Israelis only, but are inside of the West Bank. Um, that Palestinians are not allowed to be on, and they drive buses that Palestinians are not allowed to board on these, on these roads. That's another example. Um, 
Hewlett Packard, um, which has like half a million dollars, half a billion dollars in, in investments from TIA Craft, um, provides um, biometric scanner systems to the Israeli military, which are installed in checkpoints. So um, I don't know if you you know what a checkpoint is, but if you don't. Um, Israel has installed hundreds of checkpoints through the military occupation throughout the West Bank, um, which, um, you know, if you've gone through an airport, um, perhaps you're familiar with standing in line, perhaps you're familiar with uh, getting scanned. Um, this process of doing a checkpoint um, is, is not on that level. It's not on that level at all. Um, these checkpoints are built throughout the West Bank, and they're not... They're ostensibly they're for security, but effectively they immobilize Palestinians from having a normal life. Um, when you think about in your own life, um, the time it takes to travel and to go to work and to go to a school, you're often not affected by having to put a limit on how far you can travel in order to do those things. You don't think, I can only travel three miles before I go to a checkpoint, which is unpredictably closed, or unpredictably can take four hours in order to get to work. Of course, this greatly stabilizes people's ability to run businesses or to go to schools, or if you're sick, to go to a hospital. Um, there have been several instances of, of miscarriages at checkpoints because of people going into labor and unable to get to a hospital because the ambulance cannot go through a checkpoint. It is stopped. Um, and there are miscarriages. Um, at these checkpoints, um, there are also biometric scanners, which um, is effectively a surveillance system. You place your hand onto a scanner, um, it, you're, you also get like a, a retinal scan um, at some of these scanners, and it effectively tracks who you are um, and where you are going in your movements. Um, so, you know, the NSA in prison has been in the news as of late. Um, this scanner system, um, essentially if you come up under a red flag of some sort, if you have a family member or a last name or you live in a certain village where um, the Israeli military has a red flag um, for, for you for a variety of keywords or criteria, uh, you can effectively be detained longer. You may be asked to um, collaborate, to um, provide information, um, you know, about certain people for the military um, in order to pass through. Um, also, inside of Israel, HP has recently contracted to provide um, to to do the new Israeli state ID system, which effectively. Um, categorizes citizens of Israel by whether or not they are Jewish or whether or not they are Palestinian. It's, it's you know, um, I mean, it, it reminds me of South Africa and also, um, you know, candidly as, as a Jewish American, um, it, it reminds me of something that, you know, my, my ancestors had to go through as well um, in Europe. And, um, you know, Palestinians and Israelis don't necessarily uh, superficially look super different and so like to have have this system um, you know to figure out exactly who you are I mean it's you know I'll, I'll leave it up to you to, to determine whether or not you think that's a system of, of racism or a system of apartheid um, so there's several other corporations there's nine that we officially target um, and for the reasons I just explained they're targeted because they are they, they, they don't belong in T.I. Kreft's portfolio. T.I. Kreft is a corporation that says they're for the greater good, that um, many people who have plans with them chose if they, if they had multiple options because of, of this socially responsible um, you know, reputation that they have. Um, we think that T.I. Kreft should live up to its reputation, that they done a lot in the past to earn this reputation, but they, they need to be consistent and they need to divest from these corporations um, that commit 
these irrefutable and undeniable um, terrible human rights abuses. So in 2009, um, the We Divest campaign was formed um, to, to demand that TI craft um, divest. So the We Divest campaign, uh, which I talked about a little bit earlier, um, was started by Jewish Voice for Peace and is now a coalitional campaign. Um, and it's national. Um, there have been actions and demonstrations in local groups all across the country, including in Chicago, um, where we started Chicago Divest about a year and a half ago. Um, so we have, um, as a part of our local campaign, um, we have mobilized people all across the Chicago area, um, which include people with TI craft plans, um, shareholders, um, but also people who are affiliated with these institutions, so students who are at the colleges and universities with TI craft plans, um, doctors, technicians, nurses who are at hospitals with TI craft plans, people who are in nonprofits with TI craft plans. By the way, full disclosure, I work at a nonprofit that has a TIA craft plan. Um, and we've asked them to mobilize to help demand, demand for TI craft to divest from these corporations. I want to be perfectly clear, we're not asking people to divest from TIAA craft. Um, that is not a super reasonable demand for many of you with retirement plans. It would be crazy to be like, I'll just up and leave my retirement plan. And we also think that it's important for people to stay in if you have TIA craft, because it gives you an ability as a shareholder to provide leverage. TIA craft um, has specifically said in their materials um, that they very much um, pride themselves on their history of shareholder advocacy and having shareholders help to influence what their policies are. So if you have a plan, that's great. Um, and that means that you have an ability to help change the way that TICRAF manages its portfolio. Um, so Chicago to invest a little bit about what we have done. We have, um, we have reached out to students and students, student activists across the city. We've reached out to local peace groups. Um, and we've reached out to university faculty um, and staff. Um, to sign our petition and to approach TI Craft and to ask them to do, to divest. Um, every single month, we have had a demonstration outside of their office um, in the loop. Um, every single month since March of 2012. Um, every single year during their annual shareholders meeting, um, we have a national day of action all across the country. Um, where there are demonstrations outside of local TI craft offices. And additionally, at the annual shareholders meeting, which this year happens to be in Charlotte, North Carolina, we send people to attend and to help voice these concerns. We also have attempted to put um, an initiative on, on the ballot for, for these annual shareholders meetings every single year. The TI craft has challenged it with the Securities and Exchange Commission and successfully um, removed it. Um, so we, just, we, we don't let that stop us though and we, we still try and go and we try and make a demand. By the way, the National Shareholders Meeting this year is July 16th. It's Tuesday. It's three days away and we are going to be doing something in Chicago. And I'll be talking a little bit about that um, shortly. Um, so since this campaign has started, um, We've actually had a couple of significant victories. Um, so earlier I talked about Caterpillar, I talked about HP. Um, you know, TI Craft, in addition, doesn't just invest in these corporations in general. They also invest, um, I talked earlier about the Social Choice Account, which is supposed to screen out corporations, particular corporations that um, profit from weapons or nuclear power or just have a bad rap sheet in general. Um, you know, infuriatingly, infuriatingly enough, uh, TIA Craft um, has 
three of the corporations that we target inside their social choice accounts. It used to be four, but last year they removed Caterpillar from their social choice accounts. Um, and they did so for a variety of reasons. Um, they follow a uh, financial index firm that dropped Caterpillar uh, for ethical reasons. And there are several reasons, because Caterpillar is in major labor disputes with workers in Canada and the United States. Um, but one of the reasons that they listed was because of their involvement in uh, the Israeli occupation. Um, and so T.I. Kreft also removed Caterpillar from their social choice accounts. It was, it was a major victory in our campaign. Um, since that time, we've turned up the pressure um, and we have had more student involvement in this campaign. Uh, we find that when students are involved, T.I. Kreft takes a lot of notice. Um, of course, they take notice when people on the, um, on the older end of the spectrum are involved because those are the retirees, those are the people that have money in T.I. Kreft now. But they recognize that students um, are their future, that they're the people that are the future professionals and that will have retirement plans in the future and will consider whether or not to choose TI Craft based off of their actions now. So we've had increasingly more and more student involvement over the past couple of years and that TI Craft I think has definitely noticed that and is, has um, taken note and I think has stepped up the pressure. Um, I want to say that um, we have had another um, major victory in the past few months that we are officially going public on on Monday. So unfortunately, I can't talk about it tonight. Um, we're keeping it under wraps, but there was another major breakthrough in our campaign um, that we are going to do a major reveal about um, during the National Day of Action on Tuesday. So I, I really want to tell you guys, it's, it's very exciting, but unfortunately, I cannot. Um, but stay tuned, is all I can say about that. Um, so that is the, the campaign in, in a nutshell. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. This is, of course, a very controversial issue, and I'm sure that um, there are people that have, uh, may have some questions of clarification and may have some challenges to things that I've said. Um, so um, you know, I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, in the meantime, um, if you are interested in getting more involved, um, we have a petition that you can sign. Um, so I have a notebook where I can take your name and email and then add you to that petition if you would like to. If you have a TI Craft plan yourself, um, there are other ways that you can get involved, uh, which includes setting up meetings with a counselor, the TI Craft and challenging, the, challenging that counselor on why they're investing in the Israeli occupation. They do take notice and they do report back when people do that locally. Um, we have an action on Tuesday um, at noon at T.I. Kreft's office on the corner of Lake and LaSalle and Loop. Um, it's our National Day of Action. We also have actions there every single month. Um, typically they're on the 30th of every month, but they change. Um, so if you want to stay involved, I encourage you to um, sign the petition because then you will also be subscribed to our list and we'll provide you with updates. We also are on Facebook at Chicago Divest and Twitter at Chicago Divest, which is where you can learn more about our actions and about the world of divestment and um, stay updated about these corporations and about TIA crap. Um, so, would you like some fresh tea? I, I think that uh, yes. I'm going to leave it yes. there. Um, thank you all thank for you. having me. And um, I guess yeah. I look forward to breathing that infamous rebuttal period. So. Uh, thank our speaker. If you're so against TIAA CREF, are you for them in some other ways? And how can I get an account at TIAA CREF? Um, 
I want to clarify that we are not, I would not say that we are like anti TIAA CREF. Um, I think in my, the way that our campaign views TIAA CREF, um, again, we are not divesting from TIAA CREF. We're not asking people to move their money. We think that TIAA CREF structurally has has done a lot in the past they should be commended for, and structurally they have the potential to have a more socially responsible investment portfolio. One of the reasons that TI Craft is the target as opposed to some other financial firm That's is because team. they have this reputation and because they've responded to social, like social responsible concerns in the past. So we're calling on TIA Craft to be consistent with their already stated commitments to socially responsible investments. Uh, how do you get involved with a TIA Craft plan? Um, I imagine if you work at a place that offers TIA craft that you would select them as an option. He doesn't work at all. Well, so. uh, all right, but fully. Speaks to where it. What a you nice. Mentioned this, uh, you mentioned this illegal occupation of Palestine, and you mentioned you referred to the occupation of Gaza and the West Bank. There's a lot of people in this world who claim that the nation of Israel itself is an illegal occupation of Palestine. Why don't you look at it that way? So our campaign specifically uh, targets corporations that profit from, from the occupation um, and not necessarily corporations that specifically operate inside of Israel or um, operate within that framework that you described. Um, and the reason that we, we do that is because we are we're trying to make an ask that is as, as uncontestable as you can get. Um, now, there are absolutely people out there, um, you know, there, there's absolutely, as I mentioned earlier in my discussion, ways in which Israel um, has, has, a, has a framework um, societally and legally that inherently um, makes deprives Palestinians of rights that Israeli Jews have, um, and in our in our campaign, many of the targets that we have not only profit from the military occupation but profit from those structures as well. I briefly mentioned HP, which is responsible for the the state ID system. Um, it's also worth mentioning settling corporations like SodaStream. Um, which have, which are built in, their factories are in the settlements that I just mentioned earlier, but they're also inside of areas like uh, the Negev, or not called deserts, um, which are displacing indigenous Palestinians there, and that's, that's inside of Israel. Um, we're, we're trying to do an ask that has I think that strategically, when you're doing a campaign, you want to start off with the S that have the most consensus around them. Um, you have to escalate. You have to you have to achieve gradual wins. And whereas there is a lot more controversy around whether or not to target Israel specifically versus the Israeli occupation. Um, you know, with the Israeli occupation, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's so much that you can find in international law in terms of the policies of the United States State Department, in terms of the policies of most countries on Earth, um, that it's, it's virtual consensus that the occupation is wrong. So that's where we start. We start with the corporations that clearly are committing these really bad atrocities. There are other corporations that profit from the occupation in more the nine ways that, for example, like have cell phone towers for Israel, but they're inside of Palestine. That's bad too. That shouldn't be. But um, we have to. We're creating a list where you know you really can't deny it. Um, I think that once. I think that it's that it's really important to recognize though that the Israeli occupation is not separate from Israel. It's not as if these are two different countries or areas. Um, Israel's economy, Israel's um, government, um, 
is very much connected to the occupation uh, and is not separate from it. And so I think it's important that we not exceptionalize um, Israel when we, when we talk about the occupation. We need, we need to make sure that we, we don't do that. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yeah, that's a very good answer. The idea of the specific target of one specific thing. Uh, 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 why do you think Gary yeah, Aikman yeah, started to uh, have these uh, investments in if before that previously they seemed to have a pretty clear uh, history and all of a sudden or something, or gradually they started to do things like other corporations that, you know, they, why do you think they did it to begin with? And all they respond, uh, okay, you say that they stopped uh, investing in, um, they invested in capital, but are they, somebody, when they're attacked, does somebody come out there and say, oh, no, 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 you don't have a right to like, do what other corporations do and you know, try to deny that they're doing anything wrong? Or does somebody come out shame face and say, oh, no, we shouldn't do that? Russell Johnson. Yeah, you've been uh, saying we should not allow no, not our corporations to invest. I well, wait, 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 Russell. I, I'm waiting for my answer. Yeah. I thought you called it. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. That's what I thought, too. Yeah. I'm slipping. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll start with you. Um, so, you know, I, I don't work for TIA Craft. I don't know what their rationale is when they specifically invest in these corporations. Uh, what I'm guessing is the case is that they were unaware of that some of their investments were complicit in the occupation of Palestine. Um, most people are pretty unaware of the occupation in and of itself, let alone which corporations are, are invested. Um, so I you have to keep in mind that many of these corporations that we're targeting, some of them are very small, and TIAcraft doesn't have a ton of money invested in them, maybe a million dollars. Some of them are very, very large, and are, you know, a billion dollars. Um, and that, like, generally, these corporations are corporations that you typically invest in if you're in the world of finance. Caterpillar is a corporation that you, you typically have in your portfolio as, like, a large cap growth or value, you know, stock. Um, so, I mean, that's, that was probably the rationale, was like, was strictly fiscal. Um, I don't, I don't want to say that TI Craft had, I, I think it's important to recognize that TI Craft does have, like, this socially responsible fund, but at the end of the day, they're not a nonprofit. Their, their primary objective is to, um, invest into make money upon money. Um, that is the primary directive. Um, and therefore it's not it's not about uh, TI craft choosing strictly to invest or divest because um, of of like conscientious reasons. It's because whether or not something is profitable. This is really important, actually. When we talk about divestment, we have to operate in a way of understanding about how corporations work. We're pressuring corporations, we're pressuring divestment from corporations until they comply with ethical obligations. Um, so like, for example, when we're targeting Caterpillar, we're, the reason we're targeting Caterpillar is because eventually, they'll start to lose money because of our campaign. More people will start to catch on and they won't want to invest in Caterpillar or they won't want Caterpillar to be contracted for various construction projects and eventually they'll realize we're losing money because we have this contract with the Israeli military and they'll, lose the, they'll drop the contract. At which point, you know, we'll, we'll, walk, we'll walk away from Caterpillar too as a, as a target. Um, Veolia has lost more than $9 billion in contracts across the world um, because of campaigns against them, specifically, particularly in Europe. Um, and it's their investment in their, their contracts with settlements have cost them a huge financial toll. Yeah. Um, so we have to keep this in mind with TI Cref as well, is we, once, these, once these investments stop becoming profitable, they won't want to invest in them either. Um, so that's that's the important like 
as the Queen's take. As far as T.A. Cuff's reaction, um, like to our campaign, um, their, their course of action is usually to ignore us for as long as they possibly can. Um, but when we are in when we are in the room, they often deny. They do often like deny that any of their like actions are as a result of our campaign or as a result of mindfulness around the occupation. For example, when they divested, you mean they don't want to encourage you. Yeah, and they don't want to acknowledge us. So like when they when they removed Caterpillar from their social choice accounts, they didn't say it was because of the occupation in Palestine. They pointed to. Um, an index firm that divested first, and we're like, we did it because they did it. Um, and then they said it's not because of your campaign or it's not because of the occupation. But that firm, one of the reasons that they stated they did it was because of the occupation. So we know that we are making a difference even if they don't want to acknowledge it. Okay. Russell and then Ilya. My question is not so much about a craft and what they're doing. If the real problem is all the aid coming from our own government to Israel, the military, we're basically doing all the pain and giving them all the military stuff. If our taxpayers are being screwed over this, that where well, the real money problem is from our own government and not from a private corporation. So it's true. The the US military um so the United States gives Israel three billion dollars per year in uh, military aid. They're the largest recipient of foreign aid from from the U.S. Um, and you know, a lot of a lot of as as Americans um, as taxpayers, we uh, indirectly support the occupation. Um, each and every one of us, because um, of some of our tax money going to military aid. Um, absolutely, it's important that we address this. Also, it's important that we address TI Crest investments in, in the occupation. I don't, I don't see it as being an either or um, issue. I think that both are very much targets. Um, in my personal opinion, it's, it's important that we mobilize around um, lobbying our Congress people to end military aid to Israel. I, I think that divestment is a more attainable goal right now. I think that the state of Congress, um, people in Congress are not interested in um, ending military aid to Israel politically um, to do anything that is against Israeli government status quo is a very is a very challenging position if you are a legislator, if you are an elected official. So most elected officials, even if they may be sympathetic to our campaign, would never say so publicly. So that's a very, that's a very important issue as well. Um, it's challenging. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, though. That doesn't mean it's something you shouldn't address. I think it's really important to bring up, and I'm glad you did. Yeah, you got to be willing to take on eight. Well, uh, you know, it's just uh, question time, not uh, okay. <laughs> Other people have Could you speak up? So why? Give her the mic. Listen, name. One name. I can't hear you, Ileana. Put the mic in your mouth. Hug it. Repeat the questions, okay? Yeah, he will. So the question was, um, excuse me. Yeah, it's said. Okay. Yeah. Probably this would be safer. 
Oh, well. I'll just hold it. Hold it. Yeah. All right. Um, so the question was, if, if you look at your pamphlet, um, to elaborate a little bit on certain terms, specifically TIA craft, you know, like what, what do those initials stand for? What does that mean? Um, divest, what is, what is divestment? And occupation, what is occupation? So let's, let's uh, go to TIA craft really quick. So, what are the initials of TIA crap? Um, you know, I'll, I'll be straight with you off the top of my head. I don't know what every single initial means, but TIA crap, um, as I mentioned before, um, this is the financial firm that we are targeting. Uh, TIAA and crap used to be two separate uh, retirement plans. Uh, one was specifically for educators and the other was just for other people and they merged and now they're a gigantic retirement corporation that if if you work at a certain institution that offers TIA CREP, you retire with them, you put some of your salary um, into a plan with them and they invest it in various corporations and when you retire you have a nice sum to live off of for the rest of your life. Um, occupation, so So, yeah. Take your money out. Right. So I think I think it's I think it's important to talk about though, like what, what is the difference? Because I think that like when we talk about boycott, like everyone gets like boycott right away. When when you're boycotting something, there's a certain product. It's associated with something bad. You don't buy it. You know the Montgomery bus boycott was um, you know is is something that generally is the example that people refer to as social justice issues. People boycott the Montgomery bus boycott because um, of their complicity in Jim Crow policies in the United States and the South. Um, recently, people have boycotted Chick-fil-A um, because um, of the owner's um, homophobic policies. Um, so that's boycott. Divestment is different. It's, it can be a little bit more indirect. It's not necessarily you as a person making the choice, but it's you pressuring financial firms to make the choice on your behalf. Um, divestment tends to, in terms of boycott versus divestment, divestment, you are asking these giant corporations that instead of buying a product, you know, you, you pay $4 for a sandwich at Chick-fil-A. TIA Craft might have four million dollars invested in Chick-fil-A, and when TIA Craft divests, it sells off four million dollars. Now, to be clear, when when you divest that stock, it doesn't necessarily mean directly that Chick-fil-A just lost four million dollars, but it does mean that when the stock is sold, that the stock becomes devalued, and it also creates a lot more attention towards Chick-fil-A. Um, in a lot of ways, it's more symbolic. Even though when we think of divestment, we think of finance, it's more symbolic because it gets the media's attention and people start to think of Chick-fil-A differently and gets a bad rap. And that indirectly can lead to a loss of business for Chick-fil-A. So anyway, I don't know why I thought Chick-fil-A is an example, but like, that is, yeah, an example. Hey, thank you, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ilya. Neil Rep. Thank you. Um, before my questions, I, I would like to compliment you. There are a lot of made-up stories and a lot of lies about Israel, and I haven't heard one of them, and uh, that's very pleasant. Um, I, I guess I have two questions on, on the two ends. At the beginning, I thought I heard you say that the, the divestment began with Palestinian civil society, which is kind of vague. I'd like you to expand on that just a little bit. And what is your victory condition? What what will what what happens? And then you fold up your tents and go home. Cool. Those are both great questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm actually glad um, I'm glad they're asking about those questions because I think those are really important to conceptualize. So before I mentioned BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, and I think that like it's important to know who who made that call. Like, was this a bunch of people who were? Um, it's important to know that this call did not. 
It's not that a bunch of people sat around and were like, we, we don't agree with the occupation, we're going to target TIA craft. It's important to know that divestment comes from a call inside of, of Palestine from the people who are directly feeling the effects of oppression. And I think that's an important distinction to make because in, in general, um, I think it's, it's important that when you stand in support with a certain people that are oppressed for any array of reasons, that you, you, you take the lead from them in terms of what sort of solidarity they want from you. It's irresponsible to, um, to show solidarity and, and do something without being accountable to those people who are directly oppressed. Um, so like, for example, uh, Palestinians. There's so, millions of them. Who, who are you so, so, I'll, so, so I'll get to, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. But like so for so like for example, we often think of like various aid projects to people in Africa, which are um, I don't know, like people people come up with like these ideas of like let's give a bunch of our old clothes or something to a certain group of people. Those people may not ask for your clothes, like they don't want like they they, they may not be like what they need for your help. Um, but, so like, we, we have specifically responded to this call, which was in 2005, civil society organizations made this call. So though it was 170 organizations, which were nonprofits, which were trade unions, which were community organizations. Uh, it's important to know that there were not political parties that, um, that made this call. This call wasn't made by a specific sectarian group. Um, this call was made by 170 organizations that represent a really diverse cross-section of Palestinians, um, anarchists, Islamists, feminists, uh, people who are associated with left and right wing political parties. Um, I think this is really important because one of the major challenges when people who are against BDS, they say that people who are BDS are not for peace, they're against the two-state solution, they're against XYZ, Sports out that BDS doesn't have like a any official political stance because the signers don't think lots of things about what the political stance would be. There are a lot of people that sign the call that do believe in a two-state solution um, that are more associated with the Palestinian Authority and therefore have a personal vested interest in having a Palestinian state. There are many that believe in one state. Um, there are many that believe in zero states that are anarchists. Um, so it's, I think that that's an important distinction to make. So when I, when I talk about Palestinians, I talk about Palestinians as a whole, all Palestinians that face oppression um, that are largely represented by this call that is a wide cross-section of Palestinian society. Um, what, what was the second question? What's, what's the end game? Yeah. What, 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 when do you say we've won? What's your victory condition? So I think it's a good idea to refer to apartheid South Africa um, as an example of that. Um, so this campaign is pressuring for TI Craft to divest from these specific corporations. Um, that is that is the more immediate goal for now. The the ideal, of course, is to end the occupation of Palestine and even broader because it's not just about we want this form of a military system to end. I think that like when people talk about ending the occupation, there's a lot of consensus about that. I think it's important that we talk about why, why we want to end the occupation. We want to end the occupation because we don't like the idea of a military occupation, or we, do we want to end the occupation because we care about universal human rights for all human beings. This campaign is specifically vested in the latter, and that's not just about ending occupation, but ensuring equal rights for all people that live inside of Israel and Palestine. Ideally, I believe that that, that is really where, where we end and where we say we can, we can pack up and go home. Um, right now, our more immediate focus is to get TI craft to divest from the corporations on our short list. Okay. Uh, Charles, uh, Dave uh, Travis, and uh, then Gene Hart. All right, Dan, I don't really expect you to be an expert on this, but I'm intrigued by these checkpoints. Um, I mean, don't we have a situation here where there are combatants that are not in uniform? And if you're 
the checkpoints, does that mean you can't leave the 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 area? I mean, if I ran a country, to be honest with you, there's people in this room I try to keep out. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, the, the, are you locked in? My question is, are these people like locked in this area? Can they leave at all? Or? It depends. I mean, it depends. Like, the, so the occupation works differently in different parts. It works differently in Gaza, from East Jerusalem, from the West Bank. So let me just say that first. Um, when we talk about checkpoints, we primarily talk about the West Bank. Um, the checkpoints, the, the official justification of these checkpoints is security. We have these checkpoints so that way we can screen out people who are carrying weapons or seek to do harm against others. I mean, this is like why we have security inside of airports. Um, it's important to note that the overwhelming majority of checkpoints are not like on the line between Israel and the West Bank. The overwhelming majority are inside of the West Bank. So again, I wish I had a PowerPoint. This is my fault, of course. But like, if you have the West Bank, it's not that the checkpoints are on the border, it's that there's hundreds of them inside that effectively prevent Palestinians from freely traveling oh, in, inside. Um, and these checkpoints, um, you know, I, I lived in, in East Jerusalem um, about two and a half years ago, and there was a little bit where I had to go through a checkpoint to get to my job. Um, you know, these checkpoints are, in, are incredibly unpredictable. They take, it, it made my commute, um, which was, I don't know, like, it was like, three-mile commute on a bus, it, it made it take two and a half hours to go one way, um, to go through a checkpoint. Um, to go through, um, you're, you're put through these these lines and these metal bars that are very dehumanizing and degrading. Um, you essentially have to go through one of these every single day. And to, you know, you know I only had to do this for like three months, um, but it's, to do this your whole life, it's incredibly degrading. Um, beyond being degrading, it, it makes it impossible to have a normal and productive life. Imagine running a business where you have to ship things, um, where if you do produce, you have to ship food. How can you rely on food um, not spoiling? How can you rely on having like, you know, reductive, uh, reliable lines of transit? Um, if you're sick, how can you rely on going to the hospital? Uh, of course, you have to also deal with issues of racial profiling or discrimination. And it's also worth knowing that if you are an Israeli settler living in the West Bank, you don't have to go through checkpoints at all. You have these special roads that Palestinians can't go on that have zero checkpoints. Thanks. Uh, there's a Palestinian community in the Chicago area I know very little about it, so if you understand that community, could you describe it briefly, and then do you have support from that community, and what is the level of that support? Yeah, um, yeah there's, there's, there's a diaspora community um, that is in Chicago, um, yeah, primarily on the south and southwest side. Um, it's crucial in our work, as I mentioned earlier, as with any, any solidarity campaign, that you are accountable to the people that you are in solidarity with. And therefore, we, we think it's very important to form relationships with, with the Palestinian diaspora community here. As all of us with Palestinians that still live in Palestine. Um, as far as active uh, participation, um, there are, there are Palestinian organizations that are officially affiliated with this campaign, including uh, the U.S. Palestinian Community Network. Um, Palestinian, we um, do have, like, as far as like on the ground representation, we divest. Um, we do have Palestinian partners, and we do have people who are Palestinian that attend demonstrations and rallies, but it's, it's pretty diverse. We also have people from Jewish Voice for Peace who are Jewish Americans. We have people who just generally are concerned peace activists. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a diverse array of people. Thank you. Let's see. Let's see. Do you have your questions?
Charlie had his question. Uh, Marty King. This is not quite the, on the subject presented, but on your position, uh, how prevalent is your point of view among people similar to yourself? Which I think a young Jewish man in this case. A young Jewish man. <laughs> um, I would say I'm certainly in the minority. Um, like, personally, as someone who who is Jewish and who like is part of a, a vibrant Jewish, like is actually part of a Jewish community in Chicago, you know, I have definitely struggled with um, feeling comfortable in mainstream Jewish spaces um, because, unfortunately, most mainstream Jewish institutions are politicized in a way. Um, that, that often perpetuate the transgressions against Palestinians that I previously mentioned. Uh, I grew up with a narrative that completely excluded any examination of, of Palestine or Palestinians. Um, I, I definitely think that, like, you know, I'm certainly in the minority, but I also think that there is, is a shift in terms of, like, Jews of my generation versus Jews of previous generations in terms of critically examining Israel and Palestine from a social justice perspective. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, who are, are my age, they're Jewish, um, they're involved in an array of, of social justice issues in Chicago, domestically, globally. Um, in my spare time, I'm part of a group called Jewish Solidarity and Action for Schools um, that does work in support of public schools and is against the privatization of schools through the charter school system. Uh, and many people in that in that group um, also harbor the same politics and beliefs that I do. Um, and those beliefs are consistent with with beliefs of of human rights. Everyone deserving the same human rights and entitlement. Um, I think that's something that a lot of people believe in that are my age that are in my Profile. Yeah. Give us your thoughts on the Gaza on a Gaza free trade zone. What are my thoughts on a Gaza free trade zone? Much like Singapore. So I wanna I wanna take a step back and talk just a little bit about what where Gaza is now, what the situation in Gaza is. I've been primarily talking about the West Bank tonight. Um, Gaza is very different. Gaza, I, I mentioned before about like Jewish-Israeli settlements, about um, Palestinians regularly have to deal with checkpoints. In Gaza, since 2005, there are no more settlements. Israel evacuated all the settlements, but it also placed a, a blockade on Gaza um, that effectively prevents people in Gaza from from leaving ever except under exceptional circumstances and when they have certain clearances. Uh, it's, it's devastated the quality of life in Gaza and devastated the economy. Uh, Gaza relies on fishing um, for, for its economy and for you know, sustainability. Um, they, under the 1993 Oslo Agreement, they had 20 nautical miles. The Israeli Navy only allows them to fish for up to three, and if they're caught like in and around that area, um, the Israeli Navy has been known to fire upon boats or detain fishermen. Um, it's prevented people from having any sort of an export economy and becoming dependent on whatever Israel is allowed to ship in. Um, I think that like the issue isn't whether or not there should be a free trade zone, but more, more primarily and more importantly, the siege on Gaza should be lifted, and Gaza should be able to have a normal economic zone, and more importantly, a normal way of life. The UN um, issued a report that Gaza will be unlivable by the year 2020. It's some of the most appalling um, humanitarian conditions in the world. 80% of water in Gaza is undrinkable. There are rolling blackouts um, constantly. Uh, most people um, are deeply malnourished, um, there's incredible poverty rates, and a lot of that isn't because of whether or not there's a free trade zone, that's because there's a blockade. So I think that's the more pressing issue. Uh, let's see. Ooh. Okay, Marty. Uh, Marty, you have a question? Yeah, he, he just answered yeah, mine. Uh, Ayala. Yeah, 
I don't know why the left cannot ever organize. Um, what is the, why is it that Voice for Peace does not cooperate with J Street and with Americans for Peace? Um, and how much collaboration do you have with Visash Kora and Shalom uh, and Israel? So, a large part of the reason why groups like J Street and Shalom Achshav and Americans for Peace Now um, aren't affiliated with Jewish Voice for Peace is because those groups do not believe they're, they're against boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Uh, did you read Peter Weigel's book? Um, I didn't read the entire book. I read the article that he wrote. Disagree, this consensus inside, but they are not against it. District is against the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. District does, to some extent, believe in a selective boycott of settlements. Um, our campaign disagrees with having a selective boycott that only targets settlements. Um, a lot of G Street's justification for this boycott is because it's a threat to the two-state solution. Um, a lot of the way in which groups like Shalom HaShav operate and groups like J Street operate, and many groups on the Israeli left operate, though not all groups on the Israeli left, is that we need to end the occupation in order to have a two-state solution. Um, I think it's really, we, our, our campaign doesn't have um, a dedicated commitment to a specific solution. And part of the reason is because our primary concern isn't what the political outcome is, but whether or not rights are afforded to everyone. Could that happen in a two-state solution? Theoretically, yeah. Theoretically, it could happen in any state solution. I think that it's, it's problematic when groups are only interested in, in a two-state solution in and of itself. Um, they're not interested in it in order out of consideration for what is the best outcome for the attainment of equal rights for everyone in, in the region. Um, there are several groups on the Israeli left that we are partnered with that do agree with the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. One of them is the Israeli Coalition of Women for Peace, which actually is responsible for a lot of incredible research about which corporations are complicit in the occupation. Um, and we owe a lot to them. Um, there are also groups like Boycott Within, which uh, endorse a boycott of Israel. Um, it's important to note, though, that Israel, um, the Israeli Knesset, which is, effect, which is the Israeli legislature, in the year 2011, uh, passed a law that makes advocating for boycott and divestment and sanctions illegal inside of Israel. It's, it's, um, it was a really undemocratic milestone. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an affront to free speech and to, um, you know, being able to, to, to challenge, you know, the policies of your own country. Um, so, I mean, in that, that, that is more or less like why we are not affiliated with those groups. I think that those groups more often do not desire to be affiliated with us because they are very much against BDS um, as a Palestinian call as opposed to selective boycott as an Israeli or a Jewish call. Um, and it's important for us that our partners uh, do subscribe to that call and do approach solidarity in terms of being accountable to the people who are oppressed. Uh, um, so BDS is an abbreviation for boycott, uh, disinvestment, and what's sanctions. And sanctions. Boycott, divestment, sanctions. Oh, are you for sanctions? Yes. Oh, uh, well, I don't know how that works. Yeah. Liliana. Louder, Liana. Mr. Kaplan. Mr. Kaplan, yeah. I have a question. Okay. So you're talking about, uh, you know, I don't go to Israel yet. I would like to visit Asia for a couple of weeks. 
So explain to me, you're talking about like occupation, Israeli occupied territory. How about like Palestinian occupied Israeli territory? And how about like they do terrorist act they throw? Stones to Jewish community, they do violent, you know, stuff. How come you not talk about this? What what is Israel supposed to do? Is Israel supposed to protect themselves? So that's what we do. Are you pro Palestinian now? Or what are you talking about? Okay, thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. So it's crazy. So, there's never been a, a Palestinian occupation of Israel. I would just like to say that first. Um, there's never so I think that that I want I wanna clear that up first that um, Israel Israel was created in, in 1948, during that time, um, 750,000 to 1 million Palestinians were expelled from their native Lies. communities, from more than 750 cities and villages. Um, many Israeli cities, including Ashkelon, Ashdod, uh, Be'er Sheva, were originally called Ashkelon, uh, Astud, and Yerseva. Um, it's something that I personally was not aware of until I traveled to the region and, and learned about it. Um, um, as far as the issue of security, you know, we believe in a right to security for, for all peoples in the region and for human rights for all peoples in the region. And so, of course, we care about the welfare and well-being and security of Israelis that live in the region as well. We have a we have a dedicated commitment to all people having the same rights. It's important to recognize that in the current state of affairs, that um, we have an oppressor. There is one group of people that is entitled to a lot more rights than another group of people. Um, that there have been acts of of resistance, including violent acts of resistance, in the past. Um, there have also been many acts of violence and oppression and militarized violence that have been exhibited by Israel against Palestinians that happen every day that are not reported. And it's important to recognize that too. Um, it's also important to recognize that Palestinians have been resisting nonviolently, um, regularly and consistently um, for decades. Um, that every single week you will find villages um, inside the West Bank that nonviolently protest settlements annexing their land. Um, this call is a nonviolent call and is using economic activism as a way to change the scenario for people for around them. Um, and that there's there's a legacy that exists since the 1930s of Palestinians um, nonviolently challenging um, you know their their oppression. Yes, um, right uh, back there. Th okay, I, I, I think this gentleman had his hand up first and he hasn't gone yet. Which one? Oh, back there. You have the You may be a diaspora. Um, I wonder if your, uh, your campaign does not include human consciousness in general. After all, if you consider that. Uh, Think that some people that have suffered so much from a diaspora will be causing a diaspora? Would you think that uh, some people that have suffered so much in World War II will be causing pain? It's almost like saying, don't cry for me, the victim, for I can be the victim. And in the civil rights here, the Jewish community contributed a lot for the civil rights. So, I, I think if you can incorporate this into your campaign, maybe just a little human consciousness might help. So it's absolutely true that um, like there is a long history in this country of, of Jewish Americans engaging in radical activism for the welfare and benefit of, of other peoples, um, including the labor movement, including the civil rights movement. Um, and it's also true that Jews have a long history of persecution and have a diaspora of their own. 
Um, this is something that I am acutely aware of as a Jewish American, and this is something that was a large part of my Jewish upbringing. Um, probably the central part of my Jewish upbringing was that we have, a, we have an obligation to engage in social justice because of our own legacy. Um, I think that that does not mean that we're therefore invulnerable from committing acts of, of human rights violations against other human beings. Um, and that we are, we, are, we are certainly not exempt from scrutiny for that reason. Um, I mean, it's not that because, I mean, like, you know, we, we could argue about, you know, why, how, how certain human beings are more or less capable of inflicting atrocities on other people. Um, you know, whether, whether, regardless of, like, what certain people's legacies are, these, these, are, these are the facts. The things I just mentioned to you, the corporations that are complicit in these human rights atrocities, these are things that are happening right now um, that are responsible from corporations and from the state of Israel um, in a, a system of oppression that is designed by Israel. Um, like, how, I, I, I mean, those, those are the facts, and whether or not, like, one group of people has, has a certain legacy or not shouldn't exempt them from, from not having to address that and to change it. In Rwanda, for instance, uh, you know, the, during the genocide of Rwanda, I was hoping to hear a, a word from Israel like saying never again. I didn't hear it. I, I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to like scrutinize like when certain people didn't did not say things. I do think that like uh, the Jewish diaspora's commit. They did. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah. I mean, the Jewish diaspora's commitment to saying never again for people in in the Soviet Union and to people in um, I mean Yugoslavia, like in in South Africa. I mean, that's 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 definitely. You know, that's definitely been there. Um, in Darfur, I mean, the Jewish community was a large part of the interfaith coalition against genocide in Darfur. Um, I mean, that's, that's definitely there. I do think that it's important, therefore, that we, we be accountable for all forms of oppression against all peoples, including forms of, of oppression that, you know, we, we, we may be complicit in. Uh, right. uh, Bernie. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you know Rabbi Brent Rosen. Uh, sure. Sure. Uh, I do know Brent. Um, he just published a book, and it's a really great book. Um, called I think it's called Wrestling in the Daylight. Um, I don't work with him like personally on a consistent basis, but I do know Brant, and um, he, for those of you that don't know Rabbi Brant Rosen, he's a reconstructionist rabbi, um, that he's a rabbi at a, con a congregation in Evanston. Um, he, he um, for most of, he, he had sort of a journey from being like a, a liberal Zionist to being critical of the Israeli occupation and being one of the few rabbis in America to endorse boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, and he, he has a fantastic blog. Um, I, you know, I, his, his intellectual journey is, is pretty fascinating. And, um, yeah. Right over here, you got one more. Yes, uh, Mike Foley again. Uh, this was a gotcha question. Why do you use the phrase the peace process when there's no such thing? They only got a war process over there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> peace, peace process is a fairy tale that politicians feed us. This is a rebuttal. Right. I did ask the question. I did ask the question. So since 1993, there's been Oslo Accords and there's been peace talks. Um, since that time, on and off, uh, between Israel and Palestine and Jordan and Egypt and the United States and the Quartet and the United Nations and the European Union um, and Russia, and, you know, the peace, I, you know, that, that is what it's called. It's called the peace process. That's right. How, 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 you know, how effective it's been. Um, Zero. We, you know, we we are we are engaged in in, in I can't 
campaign of economic activism and a campaign of individuals using their leverage collectively to change the situation. We're not depending on our world leaders to change the situation for us, in large part because when that happens, often perpetuates the status quo. And unfortunately, um, you know, things haven't changed that much since Oslo. If anything, things have gotten uh, worse in many regards. Um, you know, there settlements have increased exponentially uh, between 1993 and 2000. The population of settlements doubled from I want to say like something like 100,000 to 300,000. And this was, you know, after after the hustle peace process. Um, so I think that the important thing is that we we're we're primarily concerned with our ability as individuals to change the situation ourselves through academic activism. And that's what's important. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to rebuttals. Ileana, you had another question? No. The buddy's there. Yes, Russell. Yes. Russell Johnson. Where does the Christian community in Israel, Palestine stand in all this? Which one? <coughs> well, mostly all. ducking. <laughs> <laughs> When you say the Christian community, you're talking specifically about Christians that live in yeah. that area, or like Christians as a, in the U.S. as a whole? No, in, in Israel and Palestine. Okay. So... All four of them. So as far as the groups that live in that area, in this area that is Israel-Palestine, um, the Christian component is almost entirely Palestinian Christians. Um, who live in in village, who live throughout the West Bank, and there's a, there's a community in Gaza as well, and East Jerusalem. Um, that community is overwhelmingly Palestinian. Um, that group encounters the same systems of oppression as as Muslim Palestinians or atheist Palestinians. Um, and are not exempted because of their Christianity, nor should they be. Um, well, no, nobody should should go through that system of oppression, period, and nobody should have a preferred treatment whether or not they are Christian or Muslim or Jewish. Um, the, in, in the United States, there there is some organizing around, around churches and Christian groups that have somewhat of an affinity with Palestinian Christians because of their own faith as Christians as well. And there are villages in, in Palestine that are Christian. Um, but the, 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 the popular you know, movement against the occupation, against oppression, uh, isn't sectarian along religion. It looks differently in different places. And in some places, um, it may be more uh, secular. In some places it may be more religious, in some places it may be more anarchist or socialist or communist, in some places uh, it's more um, neoliberal, whatever. And like the, the Christian community, the Palestinian Christian community undergoes much of the same forms of oppression as the other Palestinian communities. All right, let's go to rebuttals. Let's go to rebuttals. Yeah, well, well done. seeing no further questions. Well, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right. We should thank him. He put on his shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to, we got some visitors from Milwaukee. So, hi. And I see you brought your sister. <laughs> Anyhow, welcome. Hope to see you again. Thanks for taking the drive Would down. You like get up here and repose. I'm going to get you a minute. All right. All right, let's get to it. Right, let's see. Uh, how many of you are going to bend our ears? So, correct. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Can say Go about five uh, minutes each. I got one minute. I guess five minutes each. Uh, try to get your remarks made in five minutes. Uh, and after that, perhaps we'll take somebody else's time. Uh, so, uh, what are you doing?
I'm sorry. Just get started. Oh, no. No, 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 you want to start the meal? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, let them start. Okay. I, I would like to refer to one of the elephants in the room. Israel is absolutely necessary. During my parents' lifetime, millions of people were condemned to death because not one single country anywhere in the entire planet would allow them in to escape their killers. There must be a place where Jews can go. Period. At the same time, the Israel that we have is certainly not the Israel that I want. There's a lot of complicated history and politics and sociology, and for, uh, for, for the moment, I'm simply going to acknowledge that. I, I, <laughs> altogether, we don't have enough time to itemize. Um, I, I find Israeli politics more and more heartbreaking and I wish there was something I could do. But Israel is absolutely necessary. One of the problems, and I'm going way off the PC rails here. One of the problems is that the Arabs are stupid and gullible. There has never been a so-called leader of the Arabs, of the Palestinians, of the Jordanians, of the Syrians, who was not either a thief and a thug, or else a thug and a thief. That makes it really challenging. Really, really challenging. When Yasser Arafat died, there was a lot of speculation whether his French bank accounts total up to a full billion dollars. His personal, not his, you know, the money he was holding in trust or any of that belonging. Since the very first days of Zionism, well over a century ago, the people in power in the Middle East have exploited Zionism to suppress their own people. God knows Israel has its problems, but Israel is a democracy. There are Arabs in the Knesset. There are Arabs, citizens of Israel, in the Israeli parliament. Israel is, was founded as a secular Western democracy, and it has succeeded and prospered largely as a secular Western democracy, and that makes it a threat, a direct existential threat to every other power for hundreds of miles in all directions. So, divestment, okay. Sanctions, I don't think so. The problem, and here is the real crux of the dilemma of the good-hearted people here. The problem is finding a way to exert pressure on Israel, and boy, would I, would I love to. The problem is how to exert pressure on Israel without strengthening Israel's enemies. And you know, to, pick, to take one small example, one of the ways that Israel's enemies are strengthened, I mean, one of the grand ironies is that it's a propaganda war the Jews are losing. That, that baloney about a million Arab refugees is baloney. Uh, at the end of World War II, when Europe was completely devastated, Europe resettled 10 million displaced persons. The entire Arab world could not, refused rather, 
would not resettle a half a million refugees. Those camps, which are such a squalid disgrace, were not built by the Israelis. They were built by the Arabs in order to imprison their Arab brethren, who were more useful as propaganda than as citizens. If you can come up with a way to exert leverage on Israel that does not aid Israel's enemies, I'll be the first to sign up. I'm Michael Foley. First, I want to thank the speaker for the presentation. It was very good. Uh, I admire the way you speak about trying to focus on one specific part of this problem. It might seem like a minor problem in, in, in terms of this giant, enormous mishmash that exists in that part of the world. But you're trying to focus on one part of the problem that is very serious and hoping that you'll be able to have some positive impact on it. I also presume you know that there are a lot of people in this world who have enormous hostility toward what you were talking about. Anyway, we were talking about Israel and Palestine, so I brought my signs again. This one says, I am killing people in Palestine. And this one says, I am killing people in Israel. And I'm glad you mentioned that too. You mentioned that the people of the United States are complicit in the occupation of Palestine because we are helping to bankroll it. I stood up here before and I said, these things are correct. I am killing people in Israel and Palestine right now, this minute while I'm talking to you. I'm not the guy that's shooting the rifle or detonating the bombs, but I am helping to pay for the bullets and I am helping to pay for the explosives. My tax money goes to bankroll the whole thing. I believe that the nation of Israel and the nation of Palestine, both of them, are lackey slave colonies of the American Empire. The American Empire wants to have these two countries embroiled in eternal war, and the purpose is to enrage the Arab world. And the purpose, the reason for that is because of the oil. The American and international oil companies don't want the Arab world to realize that we're not, well not we, that the oil companies are stealing their oil. They're selling the oil for enormous amounts of money and these governments in these countries I think they get a dollar, dollar fifty a barrel, something like that. And any time the Arabs complain about anything, the American Empire gets Israel and Palestine to start killing each other again 200 people a week, and then the Arabs forget about the oil. They start screaming about the Israelis this and the Israelis that. And they forget that their oil is being stolen from them, and then finally somebody tells them, King of Saudi Arabia or something, shut up, we'll take care of the Israelis, don't worry about it. And the King of Saudi Arabia shuts up, and for the next 10 years, the international oil companies continue stealing oil. And if the Arabs get bent out of shape again, the American oil companies tell the CIA to start up the war again. And the Arabs forget about the oil. Yes, sir. Again, I'm done, but I want to thank you for coming here and giving us this presentation. And I wish you well, and I wish you success. I really do. Thank you. Chicken stash. Good evening. Uh, okay. I um would like to point out that one of the things that this organization is attempting to do is uh, the same thing that the gays did with the Boy Scouts. They got people who would um, who would sponsor the Boy Scouts, they boycotted them. And uh, they brought the Boy Scouts to near ruin. Uh, the um, the, the uh, gentleman that gave the speech here tonight uh, mentioned uh, checkpoints in Israel uh, where they um, check on uh, 
Palestinians. Well, if you had a nation that you had to build when it, from a point when it was a barren wasteland, and you had to do it with a plow in one hand and a rifle in the other hand, uh, and you were living alongside of people who were sworn to destroy Israel, sworn to uh, blow it off the map. Uh, I think that uh, you would want to have checkpoints as well. What's more, the um, checkpoints that were mentioned, uh, are these the same checkpoints where they intercept caches of weapons every so often that are bound for Palestinians to be used against Israel, uh, which happen frequently. Uh, I think the checkpoints are very much in order. Uh, also, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, I think that um, uh, I, I have seen, I have heard of many Palestinians strapping on explosives and going into a crowded Jewish area and blowing themselves up and taking a couple or three dozen Jews out with them. But you know, I never hear of Israelis strapping explosives on themselves and blowing up Palestinians. So I think that the uh, uh, that what Israel is doing is just fair and equitable, and that it's it's the right thing to do. Uh, also, as uh, somebody else before me mentioned, that the the, um, uh, the the Arabs have a bunch of crooks for leaders. They've never had a leader that wasn't a crook. The Israel has had great men that are dedicated to the nation of Israel. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much. I don't, know, I don't know if I can add anything to this discussion as far as to the uh, Israel and Palestinian situation, but I, I think I can uh, elaborate a little bit on the situation of the world as a whole. Um, I think we are rapidly coming to, there is people who are convinced in conversation for a long while around here and it's, we say one fool at a time in here. Of course we don't respect that, but um, so um, we are accelerating the rate at which we consume the fuels that the universe provides for us through the accumulation of the sun's energy in, in, in form of a chemical energy. And uh, we are accelerating the rate at which we consume these, these reserves, but at the same time, we're consuming the water, the soil, uh, we're destroying the sea, we're destroying the uh, creatures that renew the oxygen in the atmosphere, and at the same time, we are throwing the waste product of the production of or the utilization of the petroleum in the form of plastics in the, in the sea. We throw on about 4,500 tons of plastic into the sea every day. Uh, if you, as I was a diver, you can see the effects of this in the form of dead animals, birds, uh, fish, and then you see it in the form of the changes that happen because of the chemicals that they are released by ultraviolet hitting these plastics and releasing hormonal mimics that uh, change the evolution of fish and, and other creatures in the sea. 40% uh, of the photosynthetic uh, creatures in the southern seas have been eliminated in the last 40 years. 40% 40 of the creatures that renew the oxygen in the atmosphere. We are in a collision course with the Earth itself. And um, 
I think that uh, unless humanity learns to uh, live within the means of, of, of the planet that we have, we have no, no future. And it's beyond the little skirmishes we have between each other, between the borders in the United States, Mexico, Canada, or Israel, and the Arab countries, and so on. So we, we really have to think through or think hard of how do we want to go into a future that is more sustainable. If you can work hard on that and find some solution to that, well, please work on that. All right, who's next? I am. You know, so some people have uh, armies, and some people have air forces, and some people have tanks, and and occupying troops and so on and uh, for them to look at uh, people who have to rely on on strapping on a bomb and blowing themselves up as uh, somehow terribly immoral uh, or it seems they're a little biased somehow, I, and uh, when you you look at the kinds of force that people use, people use monetary force, in which boycotts and sanctions and uh, divestments and so on. Uh, yeah, uh, unions uh, might do that or try to do that. Uh, states and uh, those who possess the states uh, don't have to because they have the courts and the laws. I'm not an anarchist. I want theocracy actually I want people to rely on God's movement in their souls uh, <laughs> to be charitable hopeful generous and kind that's, that's what my my religion teaches uh, I I think that's reflected in uh, Judaism and uh, Islam and Baha'i and the Druze religion, whatever that is, I think it's something of an amalgam of, of the aforesaid. Uh, <laughs> and there, uh, it's not that atheists aren't open to learning anything either. There are all kinds of atheisms as well as religions, and you can be a very religious atheist, <laughs> for better or for worse, as with our, our Christianity and our Judaism and our uh, most Islam, uh, whatever. Uh, but. Uh, when it comes to uh, divestment uh, or sanctions, now sanctions, I, I really am not too sure that I like sanctions. So sanctions, there are sanctions applied to Haiti, Haiti, the poorest country in the, in the New World. Did it change their government? No. But it certainly impoverished 
the already impoverished people of Haiti. So, you know, you, you do have to ask questions about a divestment program or any other force of uh, boycott or whatever. All right, and you know, the Zionists uh, cut off the Jewish boycott. But, well, it wasn't just Jewish boycott, the socialists and so on back to the boycott of Germany uh, when Hitler came to power and instituted uh, laws against the Jews. So, uh, but the Zionists boycotted the boycott. Yes, do you have a preference of toast? Toast with sesame seeds around the side. Let's try that. All right, there. Thank you. Well, yeah. As a person who uh, yes, exactly. was raised and lived in Israel and served, I have so much to say. So I'll try just to to use um, to reverberate on other people in sound bites. Um, just to there are there are two ways that I relate to this issue. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm only a Jew de, uh, defined by society because society likes to peg you. And an atheist is a non-something. And it's too much, too hard for humanity to tolerate. Um, so my ideal, we'll start with the ideal. My ideal is you can call it humanist, although it's even wider than humanism. And some people can say it's anarchist, because I see all those collective divisions and categories, such as especially nationalism and godism, religion, um, gender, racism, all of them as uh, human weakness and uh, only when we can manage them to reduce them, um, I don't think we can get rid of them, but only if we can reduce them to a way that we can uh, use them as pluralism rather than a vertical look at who's better, who is right, who's wrong. Will we be able to really uh, live in some kind of peace and harmony and, uh, and a self-constructive style? But I'm also uh, a pragmatist. I know that it's not going to happen ever. Not 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 in this uh, other. Uh, maybe transhumanism can bring some improvement. So I joined uh, J Street. Okay. Uh, J Street, at least, although you're right, um, it wants it. It focuses within the system, a system that I detest, of lobbying, of talking and greasing and kissing ass in Washington. But um, uh, putting political pressure and money into uh, some kind of a practical solution of two states. Uh, if it was my choice, we wouldn't have a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. We will have just a secular state. I think God is, is just uh, trouble. <laughs> Big trouble. Um, he's not loving, he's very mean. Uh, so this is not going to happen. And the way we have to treat the issue is this. I agree with you, Neil, that it is the Jewish state, at least then, became a necessity. My family, too, same, same background. Um, it is totally legal. Where is this uh, guy? I don't know. Um, no, not you, not you. Um, Polly. It is legal. It is more legal than Illinois is legal for you to occupy from the Alani. Uh, it was uh, announced by the UN in May 5th, 48, and um, as 
uh, the, the state of the Jews. Um, so, as far as, I, I'm not saying moral, but legal. Moral, I think, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's the morality of survival. But the occupation is different. And not only the occupation, the checkpoints, even if you would say that the checkpoints uh, were formed for security, the way the Palestinians are treated uh, does involve today racism um, and unnecessary, unnecessary cruelty and, uh, and non-human um, uh, treatment. Um, so whether they serve security or not, um, the treatment is, is totally destructive to our humanism. Um, and I don't think that the Jews are more humanist than any other uh, group of people. Uh, so what we need is a civil divorce. Um, and that's practical. I don't think that at this point the Jews and the Arabs and the Palestinians are going to be lovey-dovey friends. Um, not because one is better than the other. Uh -uh, I don't know. Uh, but we are neighbors, we, we are stuck there in that hole in the Middle East. You have to make do. Whether you like it, whether there are thugs and thieves, Bibi Netanyahu is a thug and a thief and a crook as well. Uh, so politicians, all politicians by definition are not nice people. You don't want to be married to them. Um, but you know, uh, there is a reality, we will live with them, there is no other way, so start dealing with it. And unfortunately, Israel has not been doing any genuine attempt to accept this reality, instead putting, you know, facts on the, on the map. Um, I think that most people seek peace. Uh, most people just want to live, you know, enjoy life, eat well, go out sometimes. Arabs, Palestinians, well. so it, it's it's more the, the the political organization to are dealing. And when you say, oh, those people kill more people of ours than these people, the hatred is spreading and expanding exponentially as time goes on. So. Uh, you know, peace is becoming a more and more remote um, uh, idea. And I can't, I can't blame the Palestinians for being angry. No, I can't. They have a reason to be angry. They have a good reason. If I was a Palestinian, if I was in their uh, shoes, well, I, would you like somebody to come? You live with a family and... Uh, Get okay, I mean, uh, you you are great with gestures, and, no, but this is my no, not now. This is okay. okay. Uh, I shouldn't look at you and ask for a response. I'm sorry. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, what I uh, I'm I'm very frustrated is that we are not more pra the left is not more practical to cooperate and work together and compromise. Okay, just one second. I'm going with J Street in spite of the fact that I can't tolerate the system. Uh, they're going with the Jewish religion. I, I detest religion. Uh, but, you know, there is a certain purpose that might work, might, a, a remote chance of sitting to um, a, a solution of two states. I'm not looking at you now. Come on. Uh, and, and by cooperation and working together, maybe we will get a little farther. Well, five minutes. Yeah. In the 80s, I did a fair amount of studying about the Middle East peace process, Sadat, Kissinger, those negotiations. 
I've long since moved on to, among other things, the sorts of issues that Frank oh, yes, honey. refers to. Yes, honey. And uh, that sort of thinking, of course, affects my prognoses of, of, among other places, the Middle East. Surely, Ayala, you did well to get out of Dodge while the game was good. Um, and uh, it's going to be an interesting bet after a fashion as to make as to whether Israel goes down first or whether the Arab societies just crumble and lose the ability to mess with Israel because they're so busy messing with each other. There's a uh, aphorism in, in, in Saudi Arabia, as I understand it, that goes, my daddy rode a camel and I've been able to ride a motor car and my sunny boy flies a jet plane and his sunny boy is going to ride a camel. Okay. Now they're talking about their in the name, as I understand it, that they've been, so to speak, pissing away their birthright, the big oil fields. As I understand it, there's like one big oil field left. The rest of them are pretty well already dry. So that's how they'll end up riding camels. Um, and my guess is that when it's all said and done, the country out there that's going to be in the best shape of the bunch once the Saudis piss away what's left of their national birthright, so to speak, are the Turks. Because the Turks have mountains, and from those mountains flow rivers, fresh water. Now, as I understand it, there's a whole bunch of countries in the Middle East hurting for fresh water. And if the Turks ever decide to cut that water off and keep it for themselves, well, you're going to invade Turkey, are you? Well, when you do, you're going uphill. And they're looking at you downhill. Bing, bing, bing. Okay. But, you know, that's, uh, that's just uh, the Middle East. I'm not going to call it a microcosm of the rest of the world, but uh, the rest of the world probably, for the sorts of reasons Franks has talked about, among others, is going to be in a similar situation where a geography may dictate a hell of a lot of what goes on and globalism will cease to exist or if it does at all it'll be because there's still some technology left to impose a big brother super state on at least major parts of the world anyway and uh i and i'll the, 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 but they'll, they'll each have their their dynamics um the uh, Arab politics, as long as Uncle Sam is big sugar daddy of the world, Uncle Sam can set one Arab group against the other until the cows come home, so to speak. And uh, maybe that'll just keep on going until uh, maybe, maybe they'll just chew each other up before finally the technology, before Uncle Sam's ability to pony up for the sake of Israel runs out of gas, too. As I understand it, it takes a fair amount of maintenance to keep a nuclear weapon functional. And so maybe at some point the, those the Israel's nukes will run out of spare parts. But I'll have to say, to, to, to go back to what I said toward the beginning, it, I would still be of a mind to advise uh, Israeli Jews, instead of fighting over each other over what they're going to do to the Palestinians, the smart money is going to get out of Dodge. All right? and come over here. Not, not, not that the water is fine, but it still probably figures to be better than over there. Now, if they can get into Turkey, if the Turks will let them in, that might not be so bad. But other than that, you might, they might as well come over here, and while they're at it, come to the Great Lakes. There's a whole bunch of fresh water just a couple miles this away, too. And fresh water, from what I can tell, might turn out to be a pretty big deal, and an even bigger deal as time goes on. Yeah. And uh, that's it. Um, okay. All right. Cheers. All right. Yeah. Well, I appreciate. Uh... Uh, yeah. Oh well, I'll just hold it. I appreciate our speaker's courage in uh, being willing, willing, being willing to be a minority uh, in his own culture and uh, to fight for what he believes in uh, over that. 
Uh, I've said this before, I think, the 15th century through the middle of the 20th century was largely characterized, at least from our point of view, of European powers going to the rest of the world and subjugating the world and in many cases robbing and raping uh, those areas. Now, after several hundred years in the middle of the last century, the 20th century, most of those European powers pulled back. Uh, many of them did before that, but by the middle of the century they pulled back and, and gave the countries back to the, uh, to the original inhabitants. The two major exceptions that come to mind are uh, the Americas, North and South. We totally subjugated the North American natives. And in South America, my understanding is that they basically either killed or chased the natives out. Uh, the ones that didn't hide, died. Uh, and I based that on a talk by one of our members here who's from South America. Um, the other exception is Israel. Israel is, is still an occupying power, uh, a European, essentially European, occupying power. Uh, I have to say that I'm not an optimist about the situation over there. Now, Neil says that there must be an Israel, and I understand what he is saying. We can look at history and all of the pogroms and uh, things that happened to Jews all over the world. Now, this is par partially due to the fact that the Jews are some of the most cosmopolitan and successful people at going to other places and becoming part of that society to one extent or another. And, and being successful, and of course success is always, uh, it's human nature to resent success. Uh, ideally, I would say this, we should be able to get along with each other within uh, the borders of one nation, and for all the bad things we can say about our country, we're one of the best uh, places in the world to have different cultures live side by side. Uh, but as a realistic thing, this isn't going to happen in many places. Uh, well, South Africa, there was much hatred. There probably still is much, but people do live side by side. Uh, U.S. and South America, we were already talked about. Now, Ireland, Northern Ireland, there's at least a temporary respite. But that's a conflict that goes back over 600 years, and we'll, we'll see what happens uh, there uh, over time. Uh, Yes, there have been uh, uh, holocausts since World War II. Rwanda comes to mind, Bosnia comes to mind. Uh, in Bosnia, people lived side by side for a while and then got into one of the nastiest wars uh, and nastiest inhumanity to man that we've seen uh, in a long time. Uh, I'm not an optimist on this because uh, I think both groups believe very deeply that they're right. The Palestinians believe that the land is stolen. Some of it was paid for, some of it wasn't, but nonetheless they believe it is their land. They don't, uh, and there may be a majority or a large minority who believe that there is no solution uh, that doesn't include all of the land going back to Palestine. And you must, you must admit that when they had 100% of the land, let's say 150 years ago, and now they're trying to be told that 22 percent is a good deal. Uh, you know, they they may not go for that. Uh, Arafat was criticized for turning down the Y River Accord. This was supposed to be such a great deal for the Palestinians, but it included, you know, giving up most of what they uh, considered their birthrights. Uh, and one specific point regarding the force used. Uh, regarding the fact that Palestinians you, will occasionally go in and blow themselves up and commit what we call terrorist acts. Uh, the amount of force that is used by the Palestinians against the Israelis is a tiny, tiny fraction of the amount of force that is used by the Israelis against the Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinians will leave a few uh, very rudimentary rockets, and yes, they'll, they'll kill civilians, that does happen. And the Israelis then attack with the most modern jets and helicopters and bombs, etc. And I would like someone to sometime do a study of the amount of people killed and the amount of force used on each side 
uh, in, in some measure, and we would see that the Israelis are, are using much, much more. Uh, the reason they do, it's, it's an existential crisis for them. And I, I think like uh, some of our previous speakers, I'm not optimistic. I don't know how this is going to end, but I don't think it's going to end well, and I hope it does not uh, turn into a worldwide conflagration. Thank you. Unlike our previous speakers, I see a lot of hope for the Middle East based on the simple fact of demographics. There has been a baby boom going on in the Middle East since about the early 80s. And if you look on a parallelist type thing, it was shortly maybe 10, 20 years after our baby boom that the 60s happened. And what did we have? Civil rights, equality of women, many cultures and change happened because the young people were fed up with the status quo and got involved. Today we're starting to see that very same thing happen in the Middle East. There's a lot of Arab young people who have a lot better communications devices today and see how the Western world lives. And they're hungry for change. We've recently seen with the Arab uprisings in Egypt, in Syria, in Gaddafi's former country of Libya, where there has been popular uprisings by many of the people in the area in, in the world. Yes, we're still seeing some real mess as a result of this Arab Spring. But for the first time, I think ever, there has been power being taken back by the people. I recently gave a talk here on the revolutionary training school that was being used by a group called Optor that talks about how to overthrow a dictatorship to a democratic institution. I strongly encourage those of you to go back to that talk and look at the situation called from dictatorship to democracy. And I do see that based on demographic trends, based on some of the other things that I'm seeing in the parallels drawn from America around the 1960s, that I'm seeing many of the same political upheaval and change that will be coming in the Middle East. It won't be much longer before these old school Arabic politicians leave the scene. The new generation will rise up. And because of communications technology, because of, again, demographic data, and based on recent trends of what young people will do when they get into power, I see a lot of hope for the Middle East. Second of all, is that as the Israeli, as the oil runs out of the Middle East, the center of Islam is going to go back to Turkey. And Turkey is a rising power. And if you remember 50 to maybe 500 years ago when Turkey was the center of Islamic religion, they had a flowering of culture and were one of the dominant, more peaceful religions of the world. Now, as far as, you know, the environmentalist things are concerned, I don't think we're going to have a problem with energy in the next few years. I don't think we're going to have a real environmental catastrophe because we haven't even begun to innovate in some fields where we can produce more power. For me, the answer is simple. E equals MC squared. It's going to result in some kind of tapping of nuclear energy, maybe not in the form of the light water reactor we have today, but through something called thorium. I'm not going to elaborate now on it myself, but I do think that if we can get a cheap, abundant power source from the rocks, so to speak, we will solve our energy problems, we will see it. It has been proven time and time again that the best way to get a country developed is to get a good, reliable electric supply in there. And if we can find a good, cheap way of generating electricity and get it up, you know, that brings a good rise to general incomes in the area. Sure, you need food sources. Sure, you need rule of law. Sure, you need good governance. Sure, you need property rights. Sure, you need trade. But I'll tell you, to get the fundamentals down, I'm beginning to see a lot more hope in the world than I'm not 
in this rampant cynicism and of craziness. It's all a matter of demographics, a matter of shifting political economy, a matter of getting the trends that we had seen parallel with our own country from the 60s, and just a general rise of prosperity around the world. I'm going to say thank God for capitalism, thank God for globalization, and I see a more hopeful future. All right. Uh, I'll be eclectic as usual. I'm not quite certain uh, exploitative capitalism is going to be wonderful for the mankind and all the diplomatic relations, but one or two people seem to think so. I want to hey, want to thank Tom. Good to see you from Texas. Look, we got people from Texas, Wisconsin, people from all over the United States are coming here. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. You have to make sure the college accomplishes, Charlie. First of all, I got to thank you, Dan. I think you did an excellent job uh, in in covering a very what can be at times a tense issue, uh, an emotive issue and one of the best we've had in a long time. The only speaker that was better, perhaps, was the one we had two weeks ago. <laughs> Some of you might know who that guy was. Um, <laughs> uh, regarding some of the aspects, whether violence, nonviolence, the message of the Divest Chicago certainly is one of nonviolence. Uh, Brahm, I have to compliment, he mentioned the organized labor movement. <laughs> Virtually every tactic in the past hundred years or so uh, has been employed at one time or another by the organized labor movement. And various accusations have been leveled. Uh, which ones are the most effective? I will say that the things that Divest like, Chicago is seeking to do, the union, a union is not allowed to do in the United States. I was thinking about that. If I try to engage in boycotts and sanctions and divestment, and I would be summoned before the Federal Labor Relations Authority and probably be put in trusteeship as an organization, the union. But uh, nevertheless, let's see, uh, regarding again, regarding the tactics that individuals may use in confronting in situations like this, I spoke about the American Revolution and I, I was also thinking that the Americans resorted to to armed conflict. And George Washington was putting together an army in Boston and getting recruits. But amazingly enough, thinking of what people do, there were people, guys who showed up to join the American army who brought farm implements. Uh, I don't know, I guess people in certain situations uh, will resort to any means whatsoever or what they have available at their disposal. But yeah, Washington remarked, he said, these, these guys have like farm tools <laughs> and they expect to take on the, the, the most organized British army. Um, and the thing I really wanted to talk about and one that I'm gonna have to dig in a little further. One of the corporations on your list is this Viola? Viola? Viola. This is well known to us in the transportation community. That is a company who seeks to replace municipal transportation services with scab labor under contract. They have also had something in the Greens, I've heard this remark, that when they're mentioned in green situations that nasty things are said about them. Uh, apart from your issue, I think getting rid of that corporation 
would be a good idea altogether. I've not heard positive things about them. They're getting a rather negative reputation around the world in general. And if they're involved in this situation, I think that's kind of indicative of what we're talking about. But seriously, I enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much and come back again sometime. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the speaker, the young man there, that got his own mind, do his own thinking. Every Jewish person don't think the same way. Every other person don't think the same way. Everybody don't line up and be in the a column that is following the leader. People have their own mind. Uh, I've read Solomon Bracell, History of the Jew, years ago. And I read the Old Testament years ago. I'm familiar with stuff. I'm not qualified to teach the history of Jews, but I'm familiar with the history of the Jews. In reading, uh, and, and Solomon Russell was one of my favorite. And I run into a, a couple other hi history books, and, and you look in the bibliography, they got uh, Solomon Russell for, for their reference. But, uh, I was somewhat surprised and taken aback about what the Jews went through in history. I mean, the kind of things they did. The Hitler, that he come to Johnny Cup later. Even before that, they were born in Jews at the state. They did all kinds of things to Jews at different lo geographical locations on the globe. And when you get to the situation now with the Jews and the Palestinians and other neighbors in that area, you want to say, well, gee, when they went through all of this, I mean, are they insistent to other people? And that's the question you ask yourself. But I take it further than that because I'm further than that. If you show me some strife anywhere, and if it's big time and serious, somebody's benefiting from it. There's not a problem that can't be solved. Take my word for it, people. And somebody was saying different ways, and I don't know when the Middle East and Israel and the Palestine will get out of this or get out of that. They'll get out of it when the other put, the guy in charge that is benefiting from the situation now is benefiting from a change that would be made. Now, what example is greater than the so-called civil rights movement that involve black people. Even black people is a dog, like a, a, or some other people. And they would think Martin Luther King or the marches in the streets and the sadness and blah, blah, blah got them to be president of some 500 company. I mean, yeah, a Fortune 500 company. They got to be vice president here, a general manager of the Yankees, mayor of Seattle. How in the hell 10% of the people or 15% of the people can get 80, uh, uh, 85% of the people to do what you want them to do? The guy in charge benefit more from the, uh, uh, what you see, black president, than he benefit from cotton picker over here, can't pick cotton over here because black folks is over here and white folks is over there. Well, at that time, he could benefit from that strife. He, he, he was working between the Pacific and the Atlantic. And if he could get some uh, Virginia tobacco chewing redneck to think he better than another cat picker, <laughs> that's good for him. Divide and conquer. But when he decide that globalization is where he should be, and that all over the world is his, not between the Atlantic and the, and the, and the Pacific, then a black become president, a Joe manager, a baseball team, couldn't even play when I was a little boy, not Joe Man, whatever they are, and so forth and so on. The guy in charge will do the same thing in the Middle East, and I wouldn't be surprised if it happened within my lifetime. That Israel, and the Palestinian will never, will, will, won't be nothing to be talking about on oh, no, this conflict and that conflict and that conflict, oh, what we gonna do about it. When the guy in charge get 
decide changes will be made in uh, Palestinian and, and Israel to be living like this. But uh, the speaker there, keep it up, young man. I love intelligent people. Got an open mic here. Daniel, you're on. You're on. You get the last word. So, so just so I'm clear about how this works, like comment on the comments. You comment on the comments and wrap up. Comments. You're the last speaker. You're the last speaker. And you can say whatever you want. You got at least 10, 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> However you want to take the time up. Summarize your main points. Comment on the comments. You gave the best rebuttal. Yeah. You know, the man that spoke two weeks ago. <laughs> Was it the person who gave the best presentation at the college complexes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, the words. <laughs> um, we have a low bottom. I don't think I'm going to take this time to respond to the comments because there were so many. Um, that covered a lot of different things. Um, but um, I will be sticking around for a little bit if people want to approach me personally afterwards. Um, but not for long because I'm sick and I want to go home. Um, but um, I want to I want to say that I appreciate um, hearing everyone come out. Um, I think that, like, as far as, like, what I heard from, from the comments, um, I appreciate, like, the diversity of opinion, and I know that there are people that disagreed with me, not only with method, but also with, like, with, um, interpretation of history or fact, um, and even for those of you among you who did, I see, like, commonalities in terms of, um, like what our visions are, or what like our principal drives are, and I, I, I think that's great. Um, I want to just remind people again that if you are interested in learning more, um, I encourage you, I will put a sign-in sheet over on the table there. Uh, you can write down your name and email, and you can get updates. Uh, and we are having our action on Tuesday at noon. Uh, it's gonna be really cool, we're gonna reveal big surprise about a really exciting development that we have um, and it's at, it's at Lake and LaSalle at noon on Tuesday. Okay. For our online audience when this gets posted can you give us your website and a way to contact you? The website? So I would recommend we, we have a website it called, it's chicagodivest.wordpress.com um, our Facebook is much more regularly updated, which is facebook.com slash Chicago Divest. If you want to contact me, um, if you want to contact the campaign, uh, our email address is on the brochure, and it's chicagotccampaign at gmail.com. Let's thank our speaker again. Yay! Yay! Wrap us up, Ron. Wrap us up, Rom. Just <laughs> 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 <laughs>